Happy Jonathan Luther King Jr. Day, y'all. <laughs> So clear. So clear. I make magic with these hundreds, watch them disappear. Uh huh. Big ol' raindrops up in my ear. Woo, woo. If you gon' name drop, let's get it clear. Jesse, woo. BBS. I just turn the water on. Big ol' flex. Shit you never saw before. These niggas chasing me like waterfalls. Now, I definitely wanna thank June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Do y'all got games in y'all homes? One of my favorite games right now is June's Journey. So if you're a mystery girl like me, June's Journey is perfect. First of all, it lets you play like you're a detective. They call you a detective because it is a hidden objects game. As part of the game, you play the role of June Parker. She is a woman living in the 1920s and she has a passion for putting clues together. You know, making two plus two equal four or five, depending on the clues that she finds. Here's the premise of the game, right? So what had happened was June had a sister who died on Orchid Island. So now June is making her way back to Orchid Island to figure out what was the going on with the going on with her sister. And in the meantime, these hidden items are going to help us. And also we're going to decorate the island because the island is a little, it's given 1905 instead of 1920s. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to help decorate the island as well while we figure out what's going on with the use of these hidden items. Now you as the main player, you're playing June Parker, but in the meantime, we're going to be introduced to all of these other characters, you know, June's friends. And while she's trying to figure out what had happened with her sister and she gets to uncovering a whole lot of family secrets and whatnot, she also has to help her friends solve their mysteries too. Her friends got issues, so she's helping them out. She can have Yala Van Zandt on as well while she's trying to figure out what's going on, what's going on with her own sister. Okay, it's giving unsolved mysteries. And Iyanla fixed my life all in one. The continents are meeting, and that's how you have June's journey, okay? Now, if you want to join in on the mystery fund, it's very, very easy, okay? So make sure that you're using the link in my description box to go ahead and download June's journey. When you click the link in my description box to download June's journey for free, click the link again, and you'll get this relaxing hammock decoration that's worth $27, and it'll be available in your mailbox once you finish the tutorial, okay? This gift is only available until March. March 1st. I cannot wait to see y'all down to Orchid Islands where we figure out what was going on with June Parker and her sister, okay? What's up everybody? It's your sister! Welcome back to my Chanel. Happy Jonathan Luther King Jr. Majors Day, y'all. What y'all celebrate? How y'all celebrating? How are y'all celebrating? Are y'all gonna be wearing 300 year old boots today? You know what I'm saying? Are we wearing the Thomas Jefferson 3000s? What are we doing? What are we doing today to celebrate? We shall overcome. Happy Jonathan Luther King Day, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing. Me el namito. Whoosh. Anybody got their glory boots on today? Glory, oh, one day when the glory comes. <laughs> Baby, the way Martin Luther King Jr. Day will never be the same because this man has been determined to use Coretta Scott King's name in vain, Baby. so done. I'm so done. But hey, welcome back to my Chanel. Happy MLK Day. If you are black, you should have today off. If you are white, you need to be out in the fields. Okay. You need to be clocked in. You need to be working. All right. This day is not for y'all. We remember, we remember how y'all had treated that man when he was alive. Get your ass back on the clock. Caucasians to the fields immediately immediately get back to work get back to work Una, fab it, fab it. okay during black women's Haitian independence day black women's month um all right y'all let's get into today's topics so first things first monique <laughs> Let me 
say something. Monique, if Monique, if, if, if I keep my foot on her neck was a person, it'd be Monique. Like, Monique refuses to let Oprah breathe. Like, I just cannot at this point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just cannot at this point. Um, so, and it's like, it's not funny, but it is because y'all knew this was going to happen. Y'all kept summoning Monique. We all kept talking about, hey, listen, everything that Taraji's saying is stuff that Monique had been saying. We all summoned her, and she has arrived, bitch. So here is what she had to say. She obviously came uh, across um, all of the stuff that Taraji P. Henson had been saying. So let's go ahead and jump off just a couple things with that. All right. So she recently sat down with The Root, I believe, and she had a conversation with them. And she shared her thoughts on uh, what's going on between Oprah and this whole The Color Purple fiasco. First of all, and I, and I just want to give you step by step, okay? Mm-hmm. When you hear those sisters say, when we showed up, we, had, we didn't even have any trailers. When we showed up, there was no food. When we showed up, we had to get ourselves to the set. When you hear all of these things, and who was at the helm of this production, James? <laughs> Oprah Winfrey. Okay, so when you hear all of these things, and then you start saying, see, this is the treatment of the black actress. It's nothing new. It's nothing new that the trailers are subpar. It's nothing new that either the food is subpar or there's no food at all. That's nothing new. So when Oprah Winfrey sits at the helm and Taraji P. Henson says, it's an honor that we were handpicked. We were handpicked for this movie. Well, if they were handpicked for that movie, those women should have been taken care of from the moment go. Right. It, there's no way they should have walked up and there were no trailers. There's no way there was no food. And then when you hear Oprah say, but when Taraji called me, what did I do, Taraji? Lady O fixed it. When Taraji called Oprah, what happened was, James, Oprah got caught. That's what happened. And if you look up the, the title of producer and what it is a producer's job is, you'll find that what Oprah fixed should have already been prepared when they got there under the title of producer. There need not be a fix. We've watched this person as I'm watching these videos now and everything was, didn't I champion for y'all? As soon as you called me up, didn't I champion for y'all? For, for the production. It's like Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Because what you know what you did was you didn't champion for those black women, for our sisters. You didn't champion for them. What you did was you... In my humble opinion, it was, we can treat them just like we always treat the black actress. Who gonna check me, boo? Oh. I'm Oprah Winfrey. So then when Oprah Winfrey got the call, well, I fixed everything, but y'all know everything should have been done when you showed up. And that's the part that we're missing. Everything should have been done when our sisters walked on that set. It is no way that that should have gone down like that. And now when you see our beautiful sister saying, yeah, but it got fixed. It's like, y'all, we're making it worse doing that. Mm. And either one or two things is true. Either Oprah is powerful or Oprah is not as powerful at three things. Oprah is powerful. Oprah is not as powerful as we believe. Or Oprah chooses not to use her powers as it relate to championing for folks that need championing, championing for. And you know what too, James, this, and, and I say these things that I'm saying to you humbly. So when this comes out, I hope that it reflects the humility that we're trying to put with it. Okay? Yes, yes. It, it, it was easy for our community to accept a broken black woman. And we saw Taraji be broken and bent over and crying. 
it's hard for our community to accept a black woman that has a strong black man by her side saying unacceptable. Mm. In an industry while exhibiting strength herself. Okay, now, so before we start dissecting what uh, Monique said, I just want to make sure that I clarify this. She sat down with a young man by the name of James Sanders, okay? So, um, let me say what I do agree with Monique on. I like towards the end when she talked about how we were all receptive to a Black woman bending over and crying. You know, that's something that I've had, I've asked you guys several times on my own channel, which is, okay, was it that Taraji cried? That was the reason why, was that the reason why everyone was so receptive to what she said? Because what she said to me wasn't that much different from what Monique had said. It's just the approach was different. But I've also, I've also maintained that Monique was just matter of fact. We never saw Monique yelling. We never saw Monique um, agitating anyone. We never saw dis her disrespect anyone. We just saw her stand her ground. And a lot of times, yes, she was joined by her husband. And I feel like her husband, too, has caught a lot of strays because, you know, she likes to call that man daddy. Now, listen, I haven't found love that strong yet. I haven't found dick that long yet for me to call a man daddy, Okay. I ain't had no daddy when I was growing up. Uh, that's why I'm growing up. You know, I ain't had no daddy growing up. No, I'm just kidding. I actually, I actually, I actually grew up with my mother's husband. I didn't have my father growing up, but that's a whole other story. Sometimes I do see people say, "Oh, she has these views on men because she ain't had no daddy." No, I didn't grow up with my crackhead ass daddy, but I did grow up with my mother's husband. Okay, I did have a father in the home. All right, all right, cool. But um, yeah. And back to Monique and her daddy. We've seen her and her daddy just stand their ground. They've never been disrespectful. They've always, to me, been matter of fact. And their side of the story has always been co consistent, right? With all that being said, I agree with what Monique has said about her experience with uh, Tyler Perry and, Moni and and Oprah being unfair when it came to the money and being unfair when she was expected to do a lot of things for free when she hadn't been paid much, right? And I'm going to do a breakdown of both films, Precious and um, The Color Purple, so we can kind of understand what the differences are, right? But I want to say in the case of The Color Purple, I disagree. I disagree that it is an Oprah thing. Now, I want to be wise with my words because I don't feel that Monique is putting the total blame on Oprah, but I think the gist of what she's saying is that Oprah should have made sure that the Tarajis, the, the Fantasias, the Danielles, that they were taken care of, right? And I do agree with that. I agree with that. I feel that Although, yes, Oprah's not the studio, right? Oprah is not responsible for every little thing. But I do feel that with everything that Oprah has been through in this industry, and especially having been through the hurricane that has been Monique, I would have thought that going into this, she would have made sure that certain provisions would have been made so something like this wouldn't happen again. Now, maybe she did. Maybe she did, and she just hasn't spoken up on that. Um, and the ball was, you know, dropped by someone. But we have heard her say, when you guys called me, didn't I fix it for you? What Monique is saying is that that should have been a proactive thing, which I totally agree with. But proactive from whom? I think that's the question that I have, right? Yes, yes, a thousand percent yes. I really feel that Oprah should have, you know, hey, I just want to make sure our actors are taken care of, right? But was that just an Oprah thing? That's where I want to, I want to get down to the bottom of that. So I like that um, Monique's husband did say, listen, let's look at 
the fil- a film producer, right? What is their responsibility? What are they responsible for? For the, what are they responsible to look after and to take care of as a producer, right? Um, and on most, like on Indeed.com, a film producer is responsible. This is on Indeed.com. That is their job description, right? Um, is responsible for making major decisions about a film's production, overseeing every aspect of planning, securing finance for the film, post-production and distribution. Um, a film producer's day-to-day duties include hiring staff, overseeing the production process, and scheduling upcoming productions, right? From what I could gather... Taraji, Fantasia, Danielle, they got the call to be in this film from Oprah. So that would fall under the duties that we have just seen, right? Now, I'm pretty sure there was a casting director that handled broader casting. I don't think I ever shared this with you guys, but I auditioned for a part in The Color Purple. <laughs> I shared it on Dish Nation and Brat laughed at me because she was like, girl, you girl, you, you probably went in there with your wig and your your eyebrow or whatever. And I don't know if I'm brave enough to put my audition tape. <laughs> I'm not brave enough to show y'all my audition tape. Maybe one day I'll show you guys my audition tape. But I did audition. And it wasn't an Oprah thing. It wasn't under Oprah. It was a whole other casting director. And I think that the 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 principal cast, they got personal calls, right? They're still going to have to deal with casting because, you know, their their agencies have to deal with casting and have to talk with casting and then have to talk about pay and have to talk about all these things, right? Um, but um, a, a big film like this, there could be several casting directors. And, and we'll get into that, right? But also keep in mind, let's keep in mind that the job of your agent, the job of your manager is to negotiate all these things, right? Now, in my opinion, certain things you shouldn't even have to negotiate. But as I have learned, not only in the entertainment space, people will play in your face if you let them. They will. And so... The job of your agent and your manager or and or is to make sure that your face is not played with. Baby, my face is not a chessboard. This is not Monopoly. Go play with somebody else. Go play with your mama. Don't play with me. During Black Women's Haitian Independence Black Women's Month. I joue à tête papa. I joue à mouda maman. Baby, joue à vet. During Black Women's Haitian Independence Black Women's Month. Okay? So... Let's just keep that in mind. Now, let's go to um, IMDb. I think this is going to be very instrumental in us just understanding the breakdown of who was who when it comes to the color purple, the production in itself, right? So first of all, the budget was a $100 million budget, okay? I believe now, as of today, I believe the film has made 50, 50, at least 50 million to $55 million, right? As of today, I'm shooting this on Sunday. You guys will see this on, on Jonathan Luther King Jr. Day. Um, so right now it is a flop because the, the, the budget was a hundred million. Right now you're at half. And so that's a flop. You haven't even made your money back. These big studios like Warner Brothers, they are looking for profits. They are not looking to make donations. And so right now, they're probably sitting in their offices and thinking, wow, this movie was a donation because we ain't made shit. Then we looking at the press. The press has been a mess. You know what I mean? But also take into accountability as well that, you know, the cast has been talking about a lot of mishaps that happened um, from the studio's end. Right. But anyway, not only is the movie a flop, but we know that... Uh, dressing rooms was a problem. Food on set was a problem. Drivers and security was something that Taraji had to bring up. And from what I could gather with everything that Taraji has said, she's made most likely $500,000 because she said herself she hasn't seen a raise since Proud Mary. And I believe she said that was $500,000, right? So we're just going to assume that that's around what she got paid. Taraji is the most billable actress on the film, right? Um, 
which makes me think, what would the other girlies fade? What would the other girlies fade? Um, yeah, let's get into IMDB. So IMDB is a website that I think if you are an actor, an actrice, producer, filmographer, whatever, if you're in that space, movie, television, you should know IMDB. Um, if you don't know, now you know, right? This is a very, very important site to know if you want to be in this sector of it, the entertainment space. Um, those of you guys who receive auditions like me, a lot of times when I receive an audition, I go up and I look up the casting director, I go up and I look them up in IMDB, it tells me what they've been attached to, you know, oh my God, like they, they've done this, that, and third, I definitely want to work with this person, you know? Um, you'll see the director, like it, it just, it, it's, it's a Bible for every film, every television, piece of television, radio, like all those things, it is a Bible for this sector of entertainment. And so let's go to the color purple, right? The color purple. We're going to scroll down and we're going to go, I mean, right now you've seen, you know, uh, the top cast on the, um, in the movie. Let's go to all cast and crew, right? This is going to show us everyone, not just the main billable, the main cast members, but everyone even behind the scenes, right? So we can go here, directed by Blitz Bazaule, all right? Um, cast, 44 people. And these are just people that we see the most. We're not even including like the 2,500 uh, cast members that were dancers, people who are walking, just like, some people like, they're just extras, they're, they're, they're day extras. They're walking into the scenes. You know, they're in the backgrounds. Oh my God, I just got a flashback. When I was living in Miami, I did a couple background days for Hard Knocks. No, what was that show that, that The Rock had uh, that had uh, Denzel Washington's uh, son in it. Was it Hard Knocks? He was a football agent. I don't know. You guys will remind me in the comments. But I did, I did background work. I think on two episodes. And child, the days of like, oh my god, like <laughs> yo, doing background work and then waiting weeks, sometimes months, for your hundred and thirty five dollars. Like, come on, like slavery, slavery. Okay. Lord have mercy, have we come a long way? We still got a long way to go. But I know all too well, like what that's like, right? And so there's so many people that were involved that we'll never see, we'll never see their names in the credits. Um, but anyway, so these are the main cast members, and some of these cast members, I mean, I'm seeing Whoopi Goldberg on here. I think they're actually pulling from the cast members from the actual 1989 film. But anyway. Let's go ahead and go to producers. So I really want you guys to see this. So produced by has 18 next to it. This film had 18 producers. 18 producers, okay? And I want you guys to notice even the way these producers are listed. One thing I found out from a publicist years ago is that the way credits are outlined like you ever been at a movie and when they're rolling the credits like you see what names come up first according to their position that's who was paid the most i learned that from pr uh, a, a publicist i don't know if imdb is following the same script as how they're listing everyone because i do see that oprah is the last person listed um so anyway let's get into these producers that are on the film, right? So you have Michael Boog, I think that's how you say his name. And I just went and I I just wanted to click on him and I see that this man, this man has La La Land, Up in the Air, Little Miss Sunshine. Like this man has some pretty, you know, pretty big films under his belt. You have Adam Fell, who was an executive producer as well. Quincy 18, Taking the Stage. Uh, 
the musical celebration of Quincy Jones. So it looks like this person is closely working with Quincy Jones on this. Uh, Carla Gardini, no picture, but the 100 foot journey. Okay, I don't know. Uh, Quincy Jones, obviously, we all know who Quincy Jones is. I mean, do we really need to dissect his career? Um, Mark Anthony Little, you have him as a co-producer. John Wick, that's a color purple, coming to America. This man has some, some pretty big films under his belt. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is I feel that these people who have some pretty big films under their belt, I'm pretty sure that their salary was crazy. Like, they're going to have some big salaries. Um, let me see, Scott Sanders. Who, who are you, Scott Sanders? You're a producer. The Heights, Color Purple, The Odd Life of Timothy. Not really familiar with those. Um, you have Alice Walker. Thank God they put her as an executive producer. Um, she is the actual author of The Color Purple book from 1985. Um, you have Steven Spielberg, who actually owns the rights to The Color Purple. Um, and I mean, his career goes without saying. I mean, this is Steven Spielberg. You know, um, you have Oprah who's listed last. Um, do we really need to talk about who Oprah is? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, who else? Christy Krieger, who are you? Um, okay, this one, oh, this woman is well-decorated. Executive, hmm. Okay, she's got a lot going on. Oh, she's got a lot going on. Um, okay, so listen, 18 producers listed, some executive producers, some co-producers. Um, I do know that sometimes you can be credited as, an, as a producer on a project if you are the one who, you know, created the project, which is why we see Alice Walker there. Uh, if you were part of the pitching, like sometimes your name can just be attached to it. Um, and you don't necessarily have real responsibilities, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, there were 18 producers on this. So we have to factor in what, what were all of these people responsible for? I just feel like Oprah is getting hit with the brunt of the blame and we're not talking about all of these other producers. Why are we not mentioning these other people? Yes, Taraji made her, you know, made her complaints as she should have, right? She never blamed Oprah. She never once blamed Oprah. Just keep that in mind. There are 18 people listed as producers on this project. So listen, I'm not out here trying to cape for a billionaire, right? But this is kind of starting to have a massage noir tone to it in the sense that the only people, the only person receiving the brunt of the blame here is the black woman. There's no other black woman listed as a producer. Uh, let's put Alice Walker aside. Alice Walker wrote the book, right? And that's why she rightfully so is a producer on the film. But Oprah Winfrey's the only person getting all the blame. I think that that gives massage noir. I think it gives, it gives massage noir. You know what I mean? It's like, dang, y'all, everything can't always be Oprah's fault. You know what I'm saying? Now, let's go into um, Precious. I think that it is important that we dissect Precious and see how things work with Precious, okay? So you guys remember Precious, right? Precious was... Precious started off as an independent film. The budget was just $10 million, right? Some of you guys think that's a big budget. It's really not. That is a small budget, but $10 million for an indie film, that is kind of like on the high end for an indie film, in my opinion, okay? Now, just to put some things into perspective for you guys. So the actual... So Precious is a film adaptation of Push, right? Push is a book that was written by Sapphire, I believe. Hold on, let me just make sure. Okay, Push. Push was a debut novel of American author Sapphire. 13 years after its release in 1996, the novel was made into the 2009 film Precious, 
which won numerous accolades, right? Um, I did have an article that I was able to bring up uh, from Sapphire. I think it was a interview that someone did where they sat down with Sapphire and they talked to her about the film somewhere. Uh, I don't know what I did with it, but basically in the interview, what she was saying was for years, people came to her offering to turn the book into a film and she just kept saying no, no, no. And then Lee Daniels came and she just felt like Lee Daniels was the correct person to bring her book to life, right? So again, keep in mind, $10 million budget. Precious does the film festival rounds, right? It wins multiple film festival awards. It does great in the film festival realm. And then Lionsgate decides to pick up the film, right? Now, I think it's no coincidence that Lionsgate decided to pick up and purchase the film because this came as Tyler Perry and Oprah decided to jump on and give promotional assistance to the film. We all know, well, if you are a follower of Tyler Perry's career, you know Tyler Perry has had a very, very amazing relationship with Lionsgate. Most of his films or most of the films that he has been involved with have been released through Lionsgate, especially at the beginning of his film, film career. Okay. So they come in, they purchase the film and they help to distribute it even more. Right. So basically now, subsequently, you have this indie film go on to make $63 million. Okay a $10 million budget for an indie film and under Lionsgate, it goes on to make $63 million. And keep in mind, Monique walked away with a $50,000 check from this film when it was just at a $10 million budget before Tyler Perry and Oprah got involved, before Lionsgate got involved, she only walked away with 50K, right? And she was willing to walk away with her 50K and do the promotional work that um, she had to do domestically. She did not want to go international because if she went international, she was going to have to come out of pocket because they weren't providing the finances for that. I also want to make something clear as well. It, this was not in her contract. So Monique fulfilled all her contractual requirements. So anything extra she wanted to be paid extra for. That was her whole argument, and I agree with that. Also, you have Tyler Perry and Oprah that are saying, well, listen, you need to do this because you are a top contender for an Oscar. If you do this route, if you do this promotional route, you will get the Oscar and your future films, you'll get paid a big salary for it. And Monique was like, nah, I'm a black actress. I know that's not how it goes for us. Which now that I look at the fact that this film made $53 million in profit, I'm just thinking, well, y'all couldn't find nothing in the budget for, for auntie to go out there and, and kill the promotional, the promotional, uh, 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 truck trail, uh, down to London and them, down to, you know, France and them. Y'all couldn't find a million dollars in the budget to give this lady. And I'm looking at like the studio for that. But then also, okay, so the studio wasn't, didn't want to do that, right? So then she was looking, remember, she was looking for, she said, listen, like, I don't believe in working for free, right? And Tyler and Oprah agreed. So she's looking at, okay, so what's up? So y'all going to pay for this? Because I'm not paying for it. So I'm just like, you know, what was their salary with Lionsgate? Y'all couldn't find a little, y'all couldn't find a little million dollars to give auntie to go do a promotional tour? Come on now. That is her grief with Precious, the Precious thing, right? Um, and her grief that the fact that after she, you know, said, no, I'm not going to go out there and do this promotional tour and come out of my own pocket, she was blacklisted. She was blackballed for that. And I think that she has every right to be upset about that. Anyway, I say all this to say that the grief that she has with Oprah, I don't think it's the same grief that Taraji has with Hollywood in general. There are definitely some similarities, a lot of similarities, but I ultimately think that Oprah is a small part of the problem. There is black women, black people being paid in Hollywood. The problem is bigger than Oprah Winfrey. This is a bigger problem than Oprah Winfrey.
Okay. And I just feel like putting everything on her doesn't actually solve the problem. It actually helps the studio's positioning, which is look at, look at, look at this, look at this, look at this. See, this is, this is why, this, this is why we don't pay y'all. This is why we don't, mind you, we know that's not, that's not why they pay us, but I really feel like all of these studios are paying attention to this and they're like, yeah, if y'all thought there was disparity before, baby, it's going to be some more disparity to come. Like, I really do feel like that. Um, we really have to be smart and intentional with who we cast blame on when it comes to this stuff. I really don't think that this was a Oprah thing. I really don't. And I want to see other producers get more heat than just Oprah. Do y'all like, understand what I'm saying? Let me know how you guys feel in the comment section. And by the way, Eva Marcel stopped by Dish Nation last week and you know she was promoting uh, All the Queen's Men. We know that that is a Christian Keys created show. We didn't get to ask her any Christian Keys questions. I really wanted to. I really, really wanted to. But I think um, it is best for her to just keep everything positive and to stay out of it, you know? Um, but, um, it's just, I wanted the tea, but you know, couldn't get the tea. But, but um, she said this about working with Tyler Perry. Our girl Taraji P. Henson has been talking about the unfair treatment and the uh, pay disparagement against our melanated brothers and sisters. How do you feel about those statements? Cause you've been in Hollywood doing your thing for a long time and you know, it's kind of wild out there. It is, and you know what, I think Taraji has been, is amplifying a lot of actors and actresses that are melanated, what we've been saying for years. I mean, Viola Davis does an epic way, job of doing it in most of her interviews, talking about how there is um, inequities when it comes to black and um, other right, um, actors mm -hmm. and the way that looks. And to use your platform to help elevate that. You know, there are so many stories I've heard where actors, Chadwick Boseman, you know, gave up some of his money so that his other actors could yep. make more money. Yeah. Well, you think this was just a time for that to be heard because Monique been screaming that for the longest too. Well, that's what I'm saying. This, I think Taraji um, on the heels of um, Color Purple, mm. the timetable was just more amplified given the platform, but the sentiment is a sentiment that we have all had for quite some time. Right. The difference is, is look, I love being black. I love telling black stories as a black woman. I like working anywhere, but I love working at TPS because that, for me, Tyler pays. Yeah. He is on time. We eat good. He I takes know that's care right. of us. You got like, a trailer? If, <laughs> babe, no, we don't have to have a trailer. We have a whole AR. We have a whole building. I have a oh, shower and plumbing, baby. Hello. We got the Oprah one. Yes. It's very right. different. Yes. I have a very so important right. question. How's the craft services? You mean my chef? Yeah. Oh. 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 oh! oh! She was explaining, honey, she has no trailer, no, no craft trailer, services. Baby. There's a chef, there's oh. a house, there's a plumbing. What, well, is he hiring? <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Perry, I'm available, hire me! I can say I am super fortunate. I feel like right. Vivica Fox right now. I'm very lucky because... <laughs> 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 I haven't had that experience, darling. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like my big sis right now. One thing is for sure that everybody who has actually worked with Tyler Perry, and I say that because I don't feel that Monique really got the opportunity to work with Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry came in on the back end of Precious. They never got together and filmed the project together from, from, from start to finish, right? So her experience with Ty, I really wish she would have had the experience that I hear Eva and other people who have worked with Tyler say that they've had. What Eva said about working with Tyler Perry is something that I hear everyone that I know in the business that has worked with Tyler Perry say that you are treated with the utmost respect, that you are provided with luxury treatment when you are on these sets, whether it be your... She said they ain't even got no trailers. They, ain't, they got plumbing. They got, like, housing. It ain't nothing like working for Tyler Perry. It ain't nothing like going to TPS. Like, it's nothing like it. And I just hate that his experience with Monique, that that is what happened. And that she didn't get to experience what 
she got to experience with people like 50 Cent. You know, we've seen 50 Cent say things like, listen, like, I want to work with Tyler Wood. I want to work with Taraji P. Henson. You should ask about me. Ask stars how I went to bat for, you know, Mary J. Blige payment. And mind you, like, 50 Cent is another person. Everybody that I know who is working on those stars productions with 50 Cent, they get paid very, very well. But it's not just 50 Cent going to bat for them as well. It is their agents. It is their managers. Like, that's a whole other thing. And remember, Taraji spoke on that. You really need to hire people who are there for you, who are going to make sure that you are going to get the best of the best when it comes to getting paid and you know, being, being in these environments. And I think sometimes, yeah, agents that are not of color, agents that are not black, they don't understand or they don't, they're not trying to understand. But every now and then you find some that do understand and do and are willing to do the work for you. So there's so much blame to go around. I don't think it's fair to just blame Oprah. All right, y'all, let's go into this uh, episode's, not episode, child, but <laughs> let's go into today's social scandal video. So I came across this video on Real Yanni's page. I love Real Yanni. I love her content on YouTube. I love her content on IG. She's just one of my favorite content creators. She found this video of this guy um, and... He posted this as a TikTok. Let's watch the TikTok together. Quick story time. So a young lady that I had dealings with or dating, was dating, whatever you want to categorize it as, was coming over to the crib, right? And so I was feeling a little hungry. So I asked her, I was like, hey, can you, you know, grab me food? I'm hungry and I don't want to leave the crib. She said, oh, sure. If you pay for it, I'll pick it up. Hmm. So then I asked, wait, do I have to pay for it in order for you to bring me food? She said, yes, because if I pay for it, it puts me in my masculine energy. Wait, so we've been dating for a little while. And can't bring me food, $20, unless I pay for it. And to me, don't get it wrong, I was not mad at all. She still came over. I, I went and got my own food and everything. But it did make me look at her different. Because to me, that's a character flaw. Because if you only have the capacity to do something for me on the, the condition that it's reciprocated or that, like, I pay for it, that means it's not genuine, it's not in your heart. And to me, that doesn't work because I'm the opposite. I hold those doors for you on those dates because it's in my heart. I pay for everything when you're with me because it's on my heart. I book your plane ticket because it's in my heart. I am not one to keep score. And so if you can't bring somebody that you've been talking to dating a $20 meal because that puts you in your masculine, major red flag. And then I post about it on my Instagram story. And one young lady was like, well, I would have done the same thing if we're not exclusive. Exclusive? Baby, we're talking about a $20 meal. I didn't ask you to go to the grocery store, <laughs> cook, fill out my refrigerator. I asked if you could bring me food. Because we ain't got to be exclusive for me to pay for your nails, huh? We ain't got to be exclusive for me to hold all of these doors and bring you flowers. But we got to be exclusive for you to bring me a $20 meal. It's sad, man, and I think that's why we have the dating problems and trouble we have now because nobody is moving just genuinely. Everybody is keeping score and this attitude that like, I'm not doing X, Y, and Z if he's not doing this for me or if she's not doing this for me. And unfortunately, I just don't move like that. I've never had. If you are hungry and I have it, you are fed. Simple, whether I like you or not. Now, if I like you, it's a bonus but it's in my heart to be this way. But I would love to hear y'all thoughts. Okay, so I actually sent this TikTok to a guy that I was like conversing with. We never went on a date, we never did anything, but I sent it to him. And he was like, I, I asked him what his thoughts were. And he was like, yeah, I mean, damn, like, why is it that deep? Like, what's up with her talking about is taking her out of her feminine energy and is putting her in her masculine. And I was like, when I heard him say this, I immediately thought you and this woman have had this conversation before you and this woman have had the feminine and masculine conversation before women don't tend to just come out and just say, Oh, I don't want to be my masculine. You know what I mean? Like today, so many conversations with men center around 
demasculating black women, especially women in general, but black women get the brunt of it because, you know, y'all hate black women. Um, but, um, I said to myself, no, nah, there's things that this man is not saying. Y'all have clearly had this conversation. Something has happened between you and this girl before where masculinity and lack of femininity were brought up because her not buying you a meal, the same way he said, I mean, it's a meal. I don't see a woman who you're entertaining, a woman who's getting up and getting herself ready to come spend time with you at your home, I don't see her being unwilling to buy you food unless you guys had a conversation that led her to say, you know what? Yeah, and I'm not gonna be doing this because A, B, C, and D has been mentioned, A, B, C, and D has not been addressed, and so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be feeding you, baby. I'm not Uber Eats, right? And so as he's talking, talking more in the video, I just wanna tell you guys what my thoughts were as the video is going story time so a young lady that i had dealings with or dating was dating whatever you want to categorize it as was coming over to the crib right and so i was feeling a little hungry so i asked her i was like hey can you you know grab me food i'm hungry and i don't want to leave the crib she said oh sure if you pay for it i'll pick it up hmm. so then i asked wait do i have to pay for it in order for you to bring me food yes she said yes because if i pay for it it puts me in my masculine energy. Period. Wait, so we've been dating for a little while and can't bring me food? Twenty dollars? What's a little while? What's dating a little while? Cause then the next thing I'm thinking is, okay, so you've been dating for a little while. Obviously you guys are extremely comfortable. Why is this girl not your girlfriend? Why is she not your girlfriend? That's something else I want to like. What is a little while to y'all? Drop down in the comments and let me know. What does dating a little while look like to y'all? Because, baby, if I'm dating you from a little while, I'm thinking, okay, at least three months, right? A little while. That's like 90 days, right? Why am I still tiptoeing over to your house and I'm bringing you food and all this? Like, what? What? And I'm not your girl. I'm not your girl. Why am I not your woman's? Let's continue. Unless I pay for it. And to me, don't get it wrong, I was not mad at all. She still came over. I went and got my own food and everything. But it did make me look at her different. Because to me, that's a character flaw. Because if you only have the capacity to do something for me on the condition that it's reciprocated or that I pay for it, that means it's not genuine, it's not a young Oh lord. Years. Oh lord. That means it's not genuine. You bitches ain't genuine. <laughs> that means it's not genuine. You see that I'm genuinely hungry and you don't want to genuinely feed me? It's not in your heart to feed me? This man gotta be a water sign. He is either a Pisces or a Scorpio. It's, it's, it's given Scorpio. It's given, it's given Scorpio. I don't know. This man's a water sign. Next. Because I'm the opposite. I hold those doors for you on those dates because it's in my heart. I pay for everything when you're with me because it's on my heart. I book your plane ticket because it's in my heart. I am not one to keep score. And so if you can't bring somebody that you've been talking to, dating a $20 meal because that puts you in your masculine, major red flag. He has so many things in his heart. He's opening the door because it's in his heart. He's paying for your meals because it's in his heart. He booking your plane tickets because it's in his heart. Why is it not in your heart to make this girl your girlfriend? Why? Like, you are deep in her coochie, but she's not in your heart? What is going on? There's a disconnect. We got to make them continents meet. Okay? Her coochie, your heart. Make them meet. Why are they not meeting? It's in your heart to do a lot of shit for this lady, but to make her your your your, your girlfriend, right? And so these are the things that I was hearing when 
he was saying what he's saying. The guy's a handsome guy. And I, I've, I've come across his content a lot. He, like, he'd be washing fruits and shit. Like, he's, I find him to be extremely attractive. Like, he's really attractive. And he reminds me of some, the last person that I was. <sighs> Y'all, I haven't had no sex since September. I haven't had no sex. <sighs> and it's crazy because like we in the winter months, bitch. I ain't been creeped up next to nobody, son. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Um, but yeah, he's definitely he's definitely an attractive guy. Um, but why is it not in your heart to make this girl your girlfriend? It just I would I would love to hear the side of the girl, right? What is it that it, it just sounds like the girl is taking a stand? She's taking a stand because somewhere down the line, what she's been requesting is not being met with a solution. That's what I kind of get from this. Uh, let me know your thoughts on that. What do you guys think uh, about not being in your masculine? I'm, t I, I'm in agreement with the girl. I'm in agreement with the girl. Because here's the thing, too. When he was saying, it's in my heart to buy, to buy you this. It's in my heart to feed you. It's in my heart to open your doors. Yeah, it better be in your heart. You are courting her. That's the thing. As a man, it needs to be in your heart. You are courting her. You are courting her. That is your role. As a man who is courting a woman, that is your role. And I promise you, if you are consistent in courting a woman, you will not even have to ask her to feed you. When a, when a man is courting me and he's courting me well and consistently, and then we're getting into like, now it's like we're moving into being a relationship. You ain't got to ask me for shit. You ain't got to ask me. Baby, I know when you are hungry. Hey, I'm about to stop by. You want anything? I'm asking you. You want anything? What you want? Babe, you want me to finish this laundry you started and never finished? Like that's that, that, like when, when, when you are courting a woman correctly, you're not going to have these types of problems. And when you stop playing in a woman's face and actually make her your girlfriend, your significant other, and respect that relationship and do the things that need to be done in, within that relationship, you ain't going to have these conversations. That's just my thoughts. My thoughts. Let me know what you guys think. Um... One last thing, one last thing. Some of y'all came in my comments, uh, I think it was on, on my Instagram maybe, but some of you guys asked me about August Alsina's perfume, or cologne rather, versus Beyonce's cologne and asked me which one was better. August's is better. It's better. This actually gives more of what I thought this was gonna give. Just an opinion. This is just very welcoming and I like the smell and men like it on me. Men liked it on me when I wore it. Um, this, I just feel like it gives church auntie. Maybe I should try Cinoir again and see how guys react to it. I just really just didn't like it. I just didn't care for it. But Le Joy, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a better fragrance. Um, all right, y'all, that's it for today. Drop down in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. Make sure that you like, share, subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Also, oh my God, also, please keep in your prayers. I am getting oral surgery this week. I am getting 17, 17 tomorrow. I'm really, really scared about like how I'm gonna look. Please keep me, please keep me in your prayers and pray for me for my teeth journey because I'm definitely gonna be getting implants as well. and. I think I'm just gonna be giving myself a whole mouth makeover this year. Maybe I'll go down to the Columbia. 
you know, just go down. But see, y'all be going down to Columbia and y'all be coming back with Shrek donkey teeth. And I don't be wanting that. Um, so anyway, just keep me in your prayers, guys. And I'll see you guys soon. Take care. These diamonds on my body and they crystal clear. I make magic with these hundreds, watch them disappear. Uh huh. Big ol' raindrops up in my ear. If you gon' name drop, let's get it clear.